Monsters of the Market, Zombies, Vampires, and Global Capitalism by David McNally. This is part three of chapter three. Bewitched accumulation, famished roads, and the endless toilers of the earth. It is little surprise as well that the urban centers of sub-Saharan Africa today are breeding grounds of the fantastic. These hectic conglomerations of teeming ghettos, labyrinthine markets, dirt streets, squatter encampments, congested roadways, ramshackle sweatshops, and segregated quarters for the rich pulsate with high voltage energy in conflict. Take the following exoticized description of Lagos, whose more than 10 million people make it the largest city in Nigeria and one of the world's mega cities. It's rush hour near the stadium in Lagos, where Nigeria has just lost a football match. Girls balancing bags of water on their heads edge their way through the traffic to vend their, their wares. Toilet brushes, cutting shears, smoked fish, hankies, inflatable globes, and even a steering wheel are sold by boys as the coil of traffic becomes more ensnared. It's difficult to find the center, let alone the logic of this city reputed to be the most dangerous in Africa. Three bridges connect about 3,500 square kilometers of lagoon, island, swamps, and the mainland, where unlit highways run past canyons of smoldering garbage before giving way to dirt streets, weaving through 200 slums. Their sewers running with waste, so much of the city is a mystery. Whirling through this perpetual motion of people and things is a chaos of commodities. Market, transaction, market transactions occur everywhere, as street hawking becomes the survival strategy of ever-growing armies of women and young people, the sacred and the profane rub together in improbable conjugations. Routinely, routinely on sale are racks of cigarettes, orange drinks of uncertain origin in plastic bags, the Bible, the Koran, traditional hats, keychains, black market cassettes and CDs, pocket calculators, a tummy trimmer exercise machine in a cardboard box that boasts a busty blonde in a bathing suit. Tomatoes, onions, countless pairs of shoes, car seat cushions, steering wheel grips, Fan belts, sunglasses by the dozens, newspapers, magazines, dot, dot, dot. To this mania of the market, we can add the systematic relations of violence and corruption that have dominated political economic life since colonialism, manifest in the everyday coercion of police who demand bribes, in, ramp in rampant political thuggery, regular episodes of military rule, and the constant looting of government revenues by state elites. Next, factor in the psychic, cultural, and social effects of untrammeled marketization in the age of neoliberalism and structural adjustment. Crushing poverty, the decline of people's immune systems as diets deteriorate and illness spreads. The soaring rents that force the poor into ever more substandard housing. The endless proliferation Prolifer proliferation of street hawking as a means of bare survival. Then contrast all of this with the fabulous new fortunes made through financial manipulations and state contracting, and with the ever more opulent lifestyles of the rich, who, ensconced on two barricaded islands, isolate themselves from the legions of the impoverished, whose ranks swell by 300,000 newcomers each year. As segregation between these two groups grows, conflicts proliferate. Almost as quickly as new slum settlements emerge, as did roughly 200 between the late 1980s and the late 1990s, the authorities clear out whole districts inhabited by poor Lagos Lagosians, often transforming them into sites of real estate speculation, as occurred in the Morocco area where the homes of some 300,000 people were wiped out. In the midst of their precarious lives, the poor cultivate a morbid humor. 
the overcrowded and accident-prone minibuses and jitneys they use to move about the city are referred to as flying coffins and moving morgues, examples of a plebeian wit that simultaneously mocks and condemns the desperate circumstances of their daily lives. Now imagine a young writer trying to give literary expression of the dialectic of dreams and despair, violence and love, destitution and wealth, riot and resignation that animate this city. His earliest novels undertake these dialectical investigations by way of a fairly straightforward social realism. The first Flowers and Shadows, written at 19 years of age, explores the corruptions associated with the worship of money and personal power. In one potent scene, the capitalist of the novel, a factory owner, sacrifices a chicken while praying before a carved image that holds a small cutlass in one hand and a ten nera note in the other. A second novel, Landscapes Within, struggles with the dilemma of how to observe moral responsibility in a corrupt society. Then a shift occurs in both form and style. The writer moves from the novel to the short story while experimenting with fantastic modes of representation. He begins to draw upon the resources of local oral tr traditions, particularly notions of the spirit world, and of transactions between the visible and the invisible. Two stories in a volume entitled Stars of the New Curfew map a strikingly original aesthetic tra trajectory. In the City of Red Dust chronicles the travails of two ghetto dwellers during a day of 50th birthday celebrations for their country's military governor. While fighter jets thunder overhead and dancers gyrate to military music, the pair head off for the local hospital, hoping to sell their blood in order to make a few nera with which to buy food and drink. The polyvalent trope of blood peddling captures the desperate reality of people forced to sell their bodily powers, their very life energies in order to survive. More than this, however, it gestures to a society that is bleeding profusely one where everything is drenched in the blood of the poor. The trope also highlights the obscure causal relations at work in society, as the locals sell themselves to make ends meet. The governor is honored with gold necklaces from secret societies and multinational concerns. The dialectic of blood and gold is further referenced at the story's end, as one of the blood sellers flips through books that speak to the sorcery of, acc of accumulation. There were books on magic, alchemy, letter writing, books on fortune telling, on how to communicate with spirits, a complete guide to palmistry or palmistry, and the 16 lessons of a correspondence course called Turning Experience into Gold. These concerns with magic and reification, the turning of experience into gold, and with the cryptic connections between wealth and the bodies of the poor, take on greater aesthetic power in the story from which the volume takes its name. Stars of the New Curfew. As the tale begins, the narrator is describing his career, peddling useless and sometimes harmful medicines to poor Lagosians. Obsessed by selling, he will deal in anything from empty matchboxes to burnt out candles. Remarkably, he finds buyers for these too. Soon, however, he is visited by nightmares in which the stars in the sky are being auctioned and paid for either with huge sums of money, a special part of the human anatomy, or the decapitated heads of newly dead children. This dream scene is followed by one in which the salesman himself is on the auction block, as money men prefer large sums of cash, animals, or human body parts for his head. Troubled by the nightmare, he proceeds, like all sensible and secret Lagosians, to consult with herbalists and sorcerers. Then when his sales of a new medicine contribute to seven deaths, the narrator returns to W, his home city, a town with a history of slave trading, a town of bad dreams, surrounded by creeks and forests of palm trees and rubber plantations. It had become a center of excitement only on account of its oil wells. In this short passage, our author, Ben Okri, both gestures to his own hometown, Wari, and to the, 
end to the devastating downward spirals of colonial and post-colonial capitalism. Tracing capital's circuits through people, palm oil, rubber, and oil, Okri grounds the contemporary violence of market relations and the anatomization of human bodies. Back in W, the townspeople prepare for the annual public display of wealth, a violent contest between its two wealthiest families. At the heart of the competition is the fact that each of the leaders of the rich, warring families needs blood for his elixir. As the contest unfolds, the salesman apprehends an awakening of destructive and horrific ancient spirits. I began, I think, to hallucinate. I passed the town's graveyard and saw the dead rising and screaming for children. It seemed as if the unleashing of ritual forces had released trapped spirits. Nightmares running on two-headed dogs, their faces worm-eaten, rampaged through the town, destroying cars and buildings. They attacked the roads, they created pits at the ends of the streets for unwary drivers to sink into. Here, devices associated with the idioms of African witchcraft are deployed as ways of portraying the bloodlust, ritual killing, and tribal war that animate post-colonial capitalism. The day of the ritual contest arrives. Around a platform on which large portraits of the two millionaires hang, gather the ordinary inhabitants of the town. The totes, beggars, carpenters, bar owners, prostitutes, managers of pool shops, clerks, oil rig workers, petty bureaucrats, people with odd afflictions, an old man without an eyelid, a young man on crutches. All had come to catch money. We needed modern miracles, the salesman observes. We were all of us hungry, and the miracle they had gathered to witness was that of the multiplying currency. We had come to be fed by the great magicians of money, masters of our age. The linkages here come fast and furious. Millionaires, manufacturers of terror, magicians of money. And as the people fight and scramble, scratch and claw for the money that is thrown to the crowd by each side, the salesman comes to the revelation that modern society offers a single choice, to be on the block or a buyer. With stars of the new curfew, Ogri mines the imaginative resources with which he will create the fecund world of his famished road cycle. From the, reservoir, from the reservoirs of African folklore, much of it rooted in Yoruba, Yoruba literature and theater, he rallies conceptions of an esoteric world invisible to ordinary perception, a realm of spirits, dreams, and ghostly powers with which to illuminate the dynamic forces tearing at post-colonial capitalism. Yet, like all great writers, Okri is reworking traditional forms, transforming the older idioms with which he works in order to create a new aesthetic language of immense power. There is, of course, nothing new about writers using the discourses and tropes of folklore to enrich literary production. As Mikhail Bakhtin powerfully demonstrated, François Rabelais' great Renaissance novel Gargantua and Pantagruel gave literary form to the body, festive, carnivalesque language of the late medieval, early modern marketplace. Rabelais greatness for Bakhtin consists in having generated a new language drenched in the defiant laughter of the market crowd, one which mocks the dreary, pompous seriousness of official culture. In so doing, however, Rabelais did not merely chronicle the discourse of popular culture. Instead, he leavened literature with folklore, transforming each in order to create a language that was neither conventionally, conventionally literary nor simply folkloric. The result, in Bakhtin's words, was a new consciousness, one born at the intersection of many languages. The same could be said of Shakespeare, for whom popular vernaculars intersect with poetry of tremendous force. Something analogous takes place in Okri's famished road cycle. Okri turns to the folklore of the post-colonial African city, particularly its resonant discourse or resonant discourses of spirits and sorcery in order to probe the catastrophic cycle of poverty, violence, and betrayal that has entrapped its peoples. 
He too translates these discourses into a new literary language, a new consciousness designed to restore hope and renew African and world history. Yet there is a crucial strategic difference between the two operations. At times, Bakhtin treats early modern popular culture as an utterly self-sufficient domain, impervious to the effects of the official culture, ever ready to dislodge the dominant order. While far from insensitive to the resources of popular laughter, see Infinite Riches, Book 6, Chapter 9, The Forgotten Power of Laughter, Okri also grasps the narcotic tr attractions of power and money to the poor, as well as the debilitating weight of fear. Whereas Bakhtin seems at times to read Rebelez's task merely as marshalling the powers of carnivalesque laughter to smash the brittle structures of official culture, Okri perceives a dialectic of terror and power to be undone, one that feeds off the people's nightmares and divisions. He imagines that the strategic center of any struggle for liberation is the minds of the oppressed themselves. And this requires that he renovate the language of sorcery and enchantment, all the while, all the while endeavoring to unleash its imaginative powers. Okri is not unique in reworking the resources of African oral tradition for literary purposes. He had a powerful and acknowledged predecessor in Amos Tutuola, author most famously of The Palm Wine Drinkard uh, from 1953 and My Life in the Bush of Ghosts from 1954. Tutuola's works are seminal for their unique rendering of Yoruba folklore and for the way in which they highlight the element of the grotesque. References to slavery, debt, money, and wage labor frame key moments in these texts, and markets are frequently linked with forests, the traditional dwelling place of dangerous spirits. Crucially, images of corporal distortion and dismemberment loom large. Tutuola reworks, for example, a widespread folktale about a girl who refuses marriage and ends up falling into the clutches of a complete gentleman. In fact, a disembodied skull who has assembled himself into human form by renting body parts from forest dwellers. It is especially striking that the girl first encounters the complete gentleman in a marketplace and that the narrator estimates that were he to be sold, the gentleman would go for a price of at least 2,000 pounds. Running throughout Tutuola's version of this tale is a series of flows between body parts, markets, and money. Body parts are rented. The assembled creature is evaluated in terms of monetary value. And the initial contact between the girl and the manufactured creature takes place in a market. The transactions of an increasingly commercialized society are being modeled here first in terms of the buying and selling of detached human bits, and secondly, in terms of the enchantments of commodities. In this case, the desired complete gentleman, composed of commodified parts, whose market value is judged to be extremely high. Tutuola does not, however, probe the mon monstrosities of the market in terms of the unique space of the urban economy. In making the modern African city, such as Lagos, a living character of sorts in his stories and attributing to its to it mysterious, magical, and ominous qualities, Okri revolutionizes the literary language of folklore. He urbanizes it, immersing it in the fabulous and frightening transactions of contemporary urban space. In so doing, he brings the forest, the traditional site of evil spirits, into the city, remapping the urban as a site of contestation among animal and spirit forces. The result, as one commentator notes, is the spiritualization of modern urban space. The famished road begins on the eve of independence for a nation like Nigeria, with the voice of a narrator who is a spirit child of Abiku. It is widely believed, particularly in southern Nigeria, that because such children, part human, part spirit, are drawn back to the spirit world, they die early, leaving grieving parents behind. But spirit children are also attracted to the world of humans, resulting in a cycle of birth, of births, premature deaths, and rebirths. Indeed, some variants suggest that it is the responsibility of parents to offer spirit children a life worth living, 
one which makes them desire to stay in the realm of humans. Okri clearly imagines Nigeria as an ambiguous nation, one that regularly dies with the betrayal of its hopes, only to be reborn again, each time thus far into the same dismal circumstances. Tellingly, he names his narrator Azaro from Lazarus, who, in biblical lore, rose from the dead, and expounding a story in which Azaro's parents try to draw their abiku child fully into the human world. Okri reminds the people of Nigeria that they have yet to offer their child nation, the country dreamed of at independence, reason to stay. But hope lives in the cycle of rebirth, and rebirth is a task for all humanity, not merely one nation. In offering an imaginative account of what ails Nigeria, among other nations, Okri exploits the grammar of witchcraft to dramatize why the, the country keeps dying. Looming large, here are a set of interconnected themes having to do with roads, markets, power, accumulation, spirits, money, fear, history, and dreams. While both building upon folk folklore and refashioning it, Okri creates a double alienation effect. On the one hand, he uses folklore to render the everyday world strange, depicting it as a startling realm of invisible, bewitched powers. At the same time, rather than simply affirm indigenous belief systems, he transfigures them, disrupting popular beliefs so as to challenge the people of Nigeria, Africa, the world to become something other than what they are. In an atmosphere of chaos, art has to disturb something. You have to liberate it from old kinds of perception, he has argued. In the monstrously enchanted world he creates initiates us into a disorienting realm of perception and cognition. A key Okri strategy is to defamiliarize urban markets, rendering them dangerous and bizarre. In the third chapter of The Famished Road, he likens them to forests. I noticed that the forest swarmed with unearthly beings. It was like an overcrowded marketplace. The next chapter depicts Azaro wandering through the streets of the city. Having slept under a truck, he awakens hungry and strolls through the marketplace, where he is drawn to the sights and smells of food. But the peddlers of the market drive the child away, a reminder that the market satisfies monetary demand, not need. Only someone abnormal, perhaps non-human, offers him food, a man with four fingers. Then follows a dizzying description of the marketplace, one of many found in the famished road. I watched crowds of people pour into the marketplace. I watched the chaotic movements and the wild exchanges and the load carriers staggering under their sacks. It seemed as if the whole world was there. I saw people of all shapes and sizes, mountainous women with faces of Iroko, midgets with faces of stone, reedy women with, with twins strapped to their backs, thick-set men with bulging shoulder muscles. After a while, I felt a sort of vertigo, just looking at anything that moved. Stray dogs, chickens flapping in cages, goats with listless eyes, hurt me to look at them. I shut my eyes, and when I opened them again, I saw people who walked backwards, a dwarf who got a boat on two fingers, men upside down with baskets of fish, women who had breasts on their backs, babies strapped to their chests, and beautiful children with three arms. That was the first time I realized it wasn't just humans who came to the marketplaces of the world. Spirits and other beings come, come there too. They buy and sell, browse and investigate. The notion that markets are populated by invisible spirit forces is common to much African folklore. But Okri suggests that these forces are perceptible if we can develop new ways of seeing. For Azaro, this involves shutting his eyes and reopening them as if to see anew. Then things begin to emerge in astonishing shapes and forms. Mobilizing the folkloric grotesque, Okri dwells on a human corporal distortion, describing a dwarf who moves about on two fingers, women with breasts on their backs, upside down men, all of whom have their analogues and figures seen before Azaro shuts his eyes. While these are familiar tropes of the sort we find in Tutuola's novels, the shift, from, the shift from forest to marketplace is decisive, as it takes shape as an urban forest, a realm of hidden dangers. A subsequent episode in the novel highlights these. 
In this later sequence, Zaro has gone in search of his mother, who is a small trader in the market. Initially, he is overwhelmed by the sheer number of female hawkers, all of them selling identical things. There follows a detailed description of the many kinds of foods that abound there. And he continues, just as there were many smells, so there were many voices, loud and clashing voices, which were indistinguishable from the unholy fecundity of objects. A further detailed description is accents, the improbable combinations, the wild variety, the unholy fecundity of the world of commodities. Women with trays of big juicy tomatoes, basins of gari or corn or melon seeds, women who sold trinkets and plastic buckets and dyed cloth, men who sold coral charms and wooden combs and turtle doves and string vests and cotton trousers and slippers, women who sold mosquito, mosquito coils and magic love mirrors and hurricane lamps and tobacco leaves, with stalls of patterned clothes next to those of fresh fish traders. Jostled everywhere, filled the roadsides, sprawled in fantastic confusion. Next, this phantasmagoria of commodities is contrasted with the conflictual relations of market capitalism. There was much bickering in the air, and rent collectors hassled the women. In the midst of the confusion, Azaro becomes dizzy and disoriented, unable to locate his mother. Then, as in the scene where he shuts his eyes only to see differently, his perception is altered as he weeps without any tears. He encounters an old man at a stall and receives food and water from him. Azaro then lies down and sees and hears fantastic things and voices, including a conversation among the spirits of the marketplace. After discussing the poverty and violence that will afflict the country in the post-colonial period, the voices drift away and darkness sets in. In the darkness, Azaro can now find his way. Spirits of the dead move through the dense smells in the solid darkness. And then suddenly the confusing paths became clear. My feet were solid on the earth. The, strate the strategic moves here are deeply significant. Once again, acute perception begins where Azaro can see or hear spirits, where he can discern the invisible forces of market life. Despite darkness, indeed, because of it, he can now find his way. Throughout these passages, as throughout much of the famished road, real perception occurs at night in darkness. In terms of the coordinates of much folklore, this is noteworthy. Night and darkness, after all, are the archetypal times in spaces of evil and transgression. If it is only in darkness that Azaro can find his way through the marketplace, hints Okri, this is because the market is a night space, a site of violence and danger. The daylight world of ordinary perception obscures the true nature of the forces that inhabit the market. But for those able to see in the dark, the market emerges as what, is, as what it truly is, a forest world dominated by male volant spirits of the night behind the confusing carnival, com carnival of commodities Azaro now beholds confinement, turbulence, and brutality. I followed the waning brightness of the path and came to a place where white chickens fluttered and crackled noisily in large bamboo cages. The whole place stank profoundly of the chickens, and I watched them fussing and beating their wings, banging into one another, unable to fly, unable to escape the cage. Soon their fluttering, their entrapment, became everything, and the turbulence of the market seemed to be happening in a big black cage. Further on, deeper into the night, I saw three men in dark glasses pushing over a woman's flimsy stall of provisions. Moving through the darkness armed with a sort of night vision, Zaro perceives thugs, affiliated with the party of the rich, toppling the stall of a female hawker. Each time she sets her stall back up, they knock it over again. The woman reappears with a machete and sends the thugs fleeing. After they have gone, a lamplight illuminates the face of the woman, and Azaro is shocked to recognize his mother. Not only is this a case of delayed recognition, a recurring theme in Okri, it again involves the dialectic of darkness and light. Unlike the monsters of the market, evil spirits and thugs, his mother, one of millions of poor and oppressed female traders in the market, can only be recognized in the light. 
Darkness and night also figure centrally in Azaro's descriptions of the main site of capitalist accumulation in The Famished Road and its successor novels, The Bar Belonging to Madame Koto, the dominant character of The Famished Road, Cycle, after Azaro and his parents. Arguably, one of the least appreciated aspects of this cycle of novels is the way Oak Reed maps the transformative effects of capital accumulation on this female bar owner, who becomes the richest and most politically powerful person in the locale. The local people regularly describe Madame Koto as a witch. In one lengthy passage, Azaro summarizes how the locals resort to witchcraft tropes to make sense of her ever-growing wealth and power. The most extraordinary things were happening in Madame Koto's bar. The first unusual thing was that cables connected to a rooftop now brought electricity. Madame Koto, much too shrewd not to make the most of everyone's bewilderment, increased the price of her palm wine and pepper soup. In the midst of all this, Madame Koto grew bigger and fatter until she couldn't get in through the back door. The door had to be broken down and widened. We saw her in fantastic dresses of silk and lace, edged with turquoise filigree, white gowns and yellow hats, waving a fan of blue feathers, with expensive bangles of gold and silver weighing her arms, and necklaces of pearl and jade around her neck. People came to believe that Madame Koto had exceeded herself in witchcraft. People glared at her hatefully when she went past. They said she wore the hair of animals and human beings on her head. The rumors got so wild that it was hinted that her cult made sacrifices of human beings and that she ate children. They said she had been drinking human blood to lengthen her life and that she was more than a hundred years old. They said the teeth in her mouth were not hers, that her eyes belonged to a jackal and that her foot was getting rotten because it belonged to someone who was trying to dance in their grave. She became, in the collective eyes of the people, a fabulous and monstrous creation. Okrik clearly delights here in comparing capitalists to animals who subsist on the corporal energies of the poor and appropriate parts of their bodies. But note how he begins with the social material dynamics of accumulation itself, the connection of electrical cables to the bar. The processes which transmute accumulators into fabulous and monstrous creations have their roots in transformations of the human environment. Okri returns us repeatedly to the manic felling of trees. All of these material changes transfigure the individuals involved in an especially noteworthy scene as he observes the wealthy clientele in the bar, it dawns on Azaro that many of the customers were not human beings. They seemed a confused assortment of different human parts. It occurred to me that they were spirits who had borrowed bits of human beings to partake of human reality. Azaro becomes convinced that these beings are attracted to a fetish that hangs on the wall of Madame Koto's bar. He proceeds to steal the fetish and bury it in the forest, the symbolic site of malevolent powers. Here I would suggest Okri is linking Madame Koto's new fetish, money power, to longer standing fetish practices. He insinuates that urban capitalism harnesses demonic energies to the new fetishism of commodities, money, and capital. He portrays a system inhabited by creatures who borrow bits of human beings, just as the capitalist borrows the life energies of human labor power in order to partake of human reality. Ogre's movement between commodity fetishism and older witchcraft beliefs involves reworking the latter at the same time as he deepens the former. Rather than portray Madame Koto as inherently demonic, he offers us a highly ambiguous character, one capable, particularly in the early parts of the cycle, of great kindness and generosity. Instead of someone saturated by primordial evil, he portrays the evil of circumstances, depicting the method methodical transformation of an individual by conditions she tries in vain to shape. In this sense, the capitalist is a creature of fate, someone who ultimately acquiesces to an inevitable destiny, greed and corruption. It is not that Okri absolves members of the dominant class of personal responsibility, far from it. It is the choice which is fateful. Other choices would not bring the same imperatives, the same fate, but while insisting on responsibility, he highlights the ways in which the drive to escape poverty 
and to earn respect on capital's terms entails imperatives. The requirement to endlessly accumulate and participate in brutal relations of power that turn people into something quite other than what they intend. In one scene, Azaro notices wealthy men and thugs of the party of the rich pouring into the bar. He now sees the proprietress in a new light. Madame Koro, who seems to me afraid of nothing under the heavens, moved with such alacrity it appeared she was afraid of incurring their displeasure. This too constitutes a revelation. Zaro senses that, contrary to local belief, Madame Koto was far from all-powerful. Nor is she unique. She was not the only one. They were a legion. In the hierarchy of capitalist power, Madame Koto, all-powerful to the locals, submits to those richer and more powerful than she. Azaro observes one of the rich men offending Madame Koto while dancing with her. She comes at him with a broom, but he merely laughs, intoning that if she marries him, she will sleep on a bed of money. He proceeds to use his singular source of power, money, to tame her. He brought out a crisp packet of pound notes and proceeded to plaster note after note on her sweating forehead. She responded with amazing dexterity, and, as if she were some sort of desperate magician, made the money disappear into her brassiere. She danced all the while. He seemed very amused by her greed, and then quite suddenly he put away his packet of money and danced away from Madame Koto, his face glistening with the ecstasy of power. This passage captures the systemic character of what ails Madame Koto, her immersion in a force field in which money is the new god, the ultimate fetish, the source of fantastic wealth and power. Madame Koto is an, is an exemplar of the doctrine of unintended consequences. She, like all those who succeed in the fierce turbulence of the market, inevitably metamorphoses, or metamorph metamorphoses into something vampire-like, into a monstrous and fabulous creature that lives off the exploitation of others. As if to emphasize the ruptural processes involved, Okri repeatedly utilizes images of material physical transmutation, like the attachment of electrical cables to the bar, to highlight the social and material processes of accumulation that animate these personal metamorphoses. Throughout the famous road, Madame Koto's bar regularly undergoes material improvement and expansion. A new counter is constructed, almanacs of the party of the rich are placed on its walls. A gramophone is purchased, the bar is wired for electricity, an extension is built onto the bar. In noting many of these changes, Azaro remarks that Madame Koto is, in archetypically capitalist fashion, experimenting with efficiency. Soon a single bar is not enough. She opens another in a different part of the city and adds a mighty stall in the big market. As she accumulates and expands her business, the proprietress also hires laborers, prostitutes, a driver for her car, a decisive marker of her wealth, servants. She even hires Azaro's mother for a while as a cook. These accumulative strategies induce both physical and personality cha changes. Madame Koto's body grows enormously fat. Her disposition becomes nasty and vicious. But these changes are clearly linked to accumulation of money and new means of production. Several crucial scenes in Chapter 11, Book 3 of The Famished Road capture these dynamics. The bar was silent, then I made out someone chuckling. I made out the form of a head bent over, of a person wrapped in a secret ritual. I tiptoed to the counter and saw Madame Koto counting money. She was so engrossed in the counting that she didn't notice my entry. Her face shone and sweat ran down from her hairline, down her cheeks and ears, down her neck, into her great yellow blouse. She would count a bundle of notes and then laugh. It was a strange kind of laughter. It sounded like vengeance. When she becomes aware of Azaro's presence, Madame Koto is angry and begins to boast. Things are going to change, you hear. You think this area will stay like this forever? You think I'm going to be doing everything alone? No. Soon I am going to get some young women to serve for me. I am going to get one or two men to carry heavy things and run messages. Azaro comments, 
For the first time, I began to dislike her. She had changed completely from the person I used to know. Still, Madame Cotto was not done. You think I don't want to build a house, she continues, to drive a car? You think I don't want servants? You think I don't want money and power, eh? I want respect. I am not going to run a bar forever. As you see me, now I am here. Tomorrow I am gone. The manic Faustian energies of capitalist accumulation are starkly drawn here. The process of, unen of unending creative destruction, the demonic impulse requiring that everything solid should melt into air. All this is starkly encapsulated in Madame Cotto's statement. Now I am here, tomorrow I am gone. The famished road cycle highlights the modes in which capitalist power draws upon terrifying energies of self-interest and self-advancement, frenetic drives to expand. The repeated remaking of Madame Cotto's bar, which Zaro describes as its cyclical transformations, is designed to figure these frenzied imperatives. In calling up animal spirits, manic accumulation breeds wickedness, which in turn feeds off Madame Cotto's craven volcanic desire and her greedy rage. Okri portrays a machinery that breeds malevolent appropriators, one often gestured at in urban folk tales or Nollywood's voodoo horror, a global system of occult transactions between money and human bodies. More than this, in a potent demythifying move, Okri intimates that the vampire powers of the rich are nourished by the nightmares of the poor and the divisions among them. In the supercharged final chapter, The Famished Road, where fear and hope battle for the future of the country, Azaro explains that we had, we had bad dreams about one another while Madame Kodo extended her powers over the ghetto and sent her secret emissaries into our bodies. Our fantasies fed her. Okri touches a crucial theme here, one missed by many commentators. The mythology of power propagated by the rich can only survive, he intimates, if it is sustained by the dreams of the poor. In the famished road and infinite riches, Azaro's father and mother are successively seduced by dreams of fame and influence. In the first case, when his father's boxing exploits become legendary, in the second case, after his mother leads an uprising of local women and is pictured on the front page of a newspaper. Depicting the growing arrogance and self-importance of each of Azaro's parents, Okri reminds his readers that they too are implicated in the fetishisms and mythologies of power. Their fantasies of fame and fortune are the negative energies off which the powerful feed. These energies also fuel bitterness and division among the poor. We had bad dreams about one another. Poverty, warns Azaro's father, makes people strange. It makes their eyes bitter. It turns good people into witches and wizards. Here is a key to the transformations of Madame Koro. But more than this, here is a caution as to the unintended consequences of trying to escape poverty in the terms of the market. Let us now return to that market and to another critical Okrian move that deserves our attention. Recall the first passage about Azaro's experience of the market that I quoted above. Azaro tells us, I watched crowds of people pour into the marketplace. I watched chaotic movements, wild exchanges, and the load carriers staggering under sacks. In his series of deft transitions, Okris takes us through the tumult of the crowd and the wild circuits of commercial exchange to briefly observe the laborers who move these commodities about. Just as quickly he moves on, but a hint has been dropped, a seed planted. He repeatedly returns from the transactions of the market to the toil without which exchange would not be possible. While drawing our eyes to labor, Okri also underlines its invisibility in capitalist market society, the way in which labor disappears in the circuits of exchange. Concealed in Marx's famous hidden abode of production, the following passage subtly explores just this invisibility. For a while, Dad disappeared from my life. I woke up and he wouldn't be there. I went to sleep and he wouldn't have returned. He worked very hard and when I saw him on Sundays, he seemed to be in agony. His back always hurt. Dad worked very hard carrying loads at the garage and the marketplaces and he earned very little money. Out of what he earned, he paid the creditors. 
and out of what was left, we could barely manage to pay the rent and eat. After some days of not seeing Dad, I asked Mum what had happened to him. He's working for our food, she said. This intriguing passage is replete with insights. Dad has disappeared as a laborer in a market dominated by frenetic market activity. He is invisible. When Dad is physically present, he carries the traces left by work on his aching body. Something unseen, the bodily pain of the worker, serves as a stubborn reminder as to what drives the market economy. At multiple moments throughout the first novel in the cycle, Ogri returns to the sight of the body in pain. Too much load, my back is breaking, Dad tells his son. But rendering labor, Im rendering labor visible is itself painful, disquieting. A series of remarkable scenes occur in this regard when Azaro again takes to wandering through the city. In my wanderings, I left our area altogether with its jumbled profusion of shacks and huts and bungalows and followed the route of the buses that took workers to the city centre. I went on walking and saw a lot of men carrying loads, carrying monstrous sacks, as if they were damned or as if they were working out in abysmal slavery. They staggered under the absurd weight of salt bags, cement bags, gari sacks. The weight crushed their heads, compressed their necks, and the veins of their faces were swollen to bursting point. Their expressions were so contorted that they almost seemed inhuman. Then Azaro reached, or then Azaro reaches the garage, which, Echoing his earlier experience of the marketplace, he experiences as the most confusing place I'd ever seen. He observes people and vehicles hurtling back and forth in a teeming chaos of objects. In a further echo of his first trip to the market, he announces that I became dizzy, hungry, and confused. He sees grandfathers, fathers, and young children all straining under the weight of massive loads. Then he hears the protestations of a familiar voice. In a moment of shock, he recognizes his father among the load carriers. He looked completely different. His hair was white and his face was mask-like with ingrained cement. They loaded two bags of salt on his head and he cried, God save me, and he wobbled and the bag on top fell back into the lorry. The men loading him insulted his ancestry, wounding me. Azaro eventually calls out to his father who breaks into tears of shame and hurriedly moves away only to trip and collapse in the mud. Dad stayed on the ground covered in mud, not moving as if dead, while his blood trickled from his back and mixed with the rubbish of the earth. Azaro's wanderings in the city are no longer innocent, exposed to the dirty secret that the basis of modern society lies in the blood of labor, which mixes with the rubbish of the earth, he intones. My wanderings had at last betrayed me, because for the first time in my life I had seen one of the secret sources of my father's misery. Dad's body serves as a marker for the irreducibility of labor. Later in the novel, Azaro remarks of his father that his neck ached all the time. He developed sores on his feet, the skin around his shoulders, the back of his ears, his neck, and all along his spine began to peel away. His skin turned a grayish color because of the salt and cement that spilled on him from the loads he carried. The laboring body is here colonized by commodities, transfigured as a beast of burden. In a particularly poignant passage, Zaro observes his father awakening and hints at the relationship between labor and corporal pain. The dried surface of his wounds came off on the sheets. His pain was reopened. He went to work as usual. And by doing so, by dragging his ailing body to work, Dad sustains the world of commodity exchange. In a voice resonant with despair, he informs Azaro, I have been carrying the world on my head today. While much of Okri's strategy for instating the forgotten world of labor pivots on images of Azaro's father and his massive aching body, he also regularly portrays the invisible domestic labors of the protagonist's mother. Preparing food, pouring palm wine, washing sheets, making up beds, but it is her endless days in the informal economy, hawking goods, enduring the violence of thugs, and her labor in Madame Kodo's bar that figured decisively. Mum regularly returns home, having sold next to nothing, her face registering the grinding hardship of their poverty and her unseen labors. 
My life is like a pit, she intones in a moment of despair. I dig it and it stays the same. I fill it and it empties. This passage links to Zaro's early observations on the women of the marketplace. There were so many female hawkers, he noted. All of them selling identical things that I wondered just how mom sold anything at all in this world of relentless dust and sunlight. After further wanderings in the market, he intuits that his mother's situation is not unique. I saw that her tiredness and sacrifice were not hers alone, but were suffered by all women, all women of the marketplace. On another of his rambles, he comes across the industrious women of the city, carrying basins of food on their heads. Finally, in infinite riches, he encounters a horde of women, some of whom he recognizes any remarks of their world-building labors. They were the endless toilers of the earth, the strong-willed market women, the women who worked all life long in salt marshes, the hawkers who trod the endless dream of, the ro of their roads. Yet this observation is not a passage to melancholy, for hope resides in that endless dream of the endless toilers of the earth, a hope which, in the final volume of the famished road cycle finds voice in the whispered word revolution as if to underline this meaning okri assigns the boxing moniker black tiger to azaro's father the name motions first to william blake in his poem the tiger written in 1793 and inspired in part by the great uprising of the paris poor that toppled the french monarchy but more than this, Blake had also drawn inspiration from the struggle of Maroons, self-liberated former slaves from Africa in the Americas. And this theme features potently in his poem, America, with its memorable line, Thou art the image of God who dwells in darkness of Africa. Okri amplifies the sound of Blake's subversive call by bestowing the nickname Black Tiger on Azaro's father. Freedom Road, that elusive path of hope and human redemption, runs through Africa. These two visionary poet agitators remind us. As if to cement this link to Blake, Okri has also published a volume of poems, Mental Fight, which takes its title from Blake's revolutionary dictum. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem. But Black Tiger is not the singular symbol of the oppressed, as we have seen. The industrious women of the city also take the stage, nowhere more dramatically than in the chapters of Infinite Riches that recount an uprising of the local women, led by Mum, who raid a police station and free its prisoners. As the women meet, organize, and mobilize, the word politics took on a warmer meeting, notes Zaro. But uttering a warning as to the dangers of the postcolonial period, Okri did it Okri details how the rising of the women was soon taken over by new women with beautiful dresses and polished manners, elite women who tried to lead the original women in another direction, quieting their urge to rebel, their desire to raid stations, descend on law courts and hospitals. The demobilization of poor women, the refashioning of their movement by women of the dominant classes, once again leaves the people treading the endless road of their dreams. The famished road of freedom can be satiated, hint, hints Okri, only through the means envisioned by Blake in 1793. Their propulsive self-liberation of the oppressed, an emancipation movement through which they remake themselves and their world. With this move into the sphere of historical action, Okri's subtle deployment of the, imag the imagery of witchcraft transcends the domain of folklore while preserving its essential ingredients. To paraphrase Walter Benjamin, Okri dissolves folklore into the space of history. By enlisting witchcraft idioms in the service of radical aesthetics, a dialectical optics that estranges the modes of perception and cognition associated with commodified life, Okri tethers images of bewitched accumulation to a defetishizing impulse. His initial move involves strategies of defamiliarization that render the transactions of the capitalist market strange and bewildering. Like contemporary urban folklore, Okri attends to the anonymity of sorcery, to the sheer random random randomness of violence in market society. 
This strategy prized open the space for new modes of experiencing capitalist relations. As when Azaro closes his eyes and, reopening them, sees immaterial beings in the market. This displacement of ordinary perception enables us to apprehend magicians of money as part animal, part spirit creatures, who borrow bits of human beings to partake of reality. Okri thus draws upon popular rhetorics of enrichment through disembodiment to construct an intricate image of capital as a vampire power, seizing the laboring bodies of the poor. Even colonizing them, as salt and cement do with dad's skin, in order to feed the demonic appetites of accumulation. Crucially, this accumulation does not merely fatten the oppressors, though it certainly does that. More significantly, it steadily expands their material power, the means of production, and the laborers at their command, as we see with the cyclical transformations of Madame Kodo's bar. But just as there is no accumulated wealth without the labor of the poor, so there can be no vampires without the blood of the living. And in the sheer stubborn survival of the poor, their persistent struggle for a better life, hope resides. As much as capital possesses them invading their bodies and spirits, the world's laboring poor, the endless toilers of the earth, can never be fully colonized. They are relentlessly driven by a hunger of both the body and the spirit to remake the world. But in order to do so, they must redream it. And this means awakening from the nightmare world of everyday life in order to activate dreams of justice and hope. As Black Tiger tells Azaro, we must take an interest in politics. We must become spies on behalf of justice. We must look at the world with new eyes. We must look at ourselves differently. We haven't begun to live yet. If we have not begun to live yet, this is because we inhabit a vampiric night world, a zombie economy of the living dead. Okri's accomplishment is to have opened doors onto this world by disrupting ordinary modes of perception. Reworking popular hermeneutics of suspicion, he helps us to see what eludes everyday experience in bourgeois society, grotesque market forces that colonize human bodies and spirits. Giving these monsters and their effects a fantastic perceptibility, he portrays the world in which we live as an occult economy of terrifying transactions between bodies and money. But in that space, he also locates the spies on behalf of justice who compose the hopeful monsters of popular revolt from below.